All right. Everybody is well. See my, my guy, Slavoj Žižek, I'm having my back right now because I'm going to be reading through his uh, introduction of the sublime object of ideology, which is a book that he wrote in 1989. Uh, if you're into this type of reading, um, I would suggest this book to get a grasp of how ideology um, is operating today uh, within our society. And, um, you know, you might not like Zizek, his ideas or postmodernism, but the ideas uh, are worth putting out there and exploring. Um, so I'm going to read the introduction here. Uh, it's not that long. And um, we'll go from there. Introduction. In that book of Habermas, which specifically addresses the issue of so-called post-structuralism, their philosophique discars der modern, there is a curious detail concerning Lacan's name. It is mentioned only five times, and each time in conjunction with other names. Let us cite all five instances. Page 70, von Hegel und Marx bis Nietzsche und Heidegger. Von Batil und Lacan bis Foucault und Darida. Batil, Lacan, and Foucault. Meet Levi Strauss and Lacan. Then, seit Genosis, Schen Structuralismus, die Ethnologie von Levi Strauss and die Lacanische Psychoanalyse, von Freud, Order C.G. Young, von Lacan, Order Levi Strauss. So those are the names. A Lacanian theory is not then perceived as a specific entity. It is, to use Laclau's and Moff's term, always articulated in a series of equivalences. Why this refusal to confront Lacan directly in a book which includes lengthy discussions of Batia, Derrida, and above all Foucault, the real partner of Habermas? The answer to this enigma is to be found in another curiosity of the Habermas book in a curious incident concerning Althusser. Of course, we are using the term curious incident in a Sherlock Holmesian sense. Althusser's name is not even mentioned in Habermas's book, and that is the curious incident. So our first thesis would be that the great debate occupying the foreground of today's intellectual scene, the Habermas-Foucault debate, is masking another opposition another debate which is theoretically more far-reaching, the Althusser-Lacan debate. There is something enigmatic in the sudden eclipse of the Althusserian school. It cannot be explained away in terms of a theoretical defect or a theoretical defeat. It is more as if that were in Althusserian theory, a traumatic kernel which had to be quickly forgotten, quote-unquote repressed. It is an effective case of theoretical amnesia. Why then was the opposition Althusser Lacan replaced in a kind of metaphorical substitution by the opposition Habermas Foucault? At stake here are four different ethical positions and at the same time, four different notions of the subject. With Habermas, we have the ethics of the unbroken communication, the ideal of the universal, transparent intersubjective community. The notion of the subject behind this is, of course, the philosophy of language version of the old subject of transcendental reflection. With Foucault, we have a turn against that universalist ethics, which results in a kind of aestheticization of ethics. Each subject must, without any support from universal rules, build his own mode of self-mastery. He must harmonize the antagonism of the powers within himself, invent himself, so to speak, produce himself as subject, find his own particular art of living. This is why Foucault was so fascinated by marginal lifestyles, constructing their particular mode of subjectivity, the sadomasochistic homosexual universe. It's not very difficult to detect how this Foucauldian notion of subject enters the humanist elitist tradition. Its closest realization would be the Renaissance ideal of the all-around personality, mastering the passions within himself and making out of his own life a work of art. Foucault's notion of the subject is rather a classical one. Subject as the power of self 
mediation and harmonizing the antagonistic forces as a way of mastering the, quote, use of pleasures through a restoration of the image of self. Here Habermas and Foucault are two sides of the same coin. The real break is represented by Althusser, by his insistence on the fact that a certain cleft, a certain fissure, misrecognition characterizes the human condition as such by the thesis that the idea of the possible end of ideology is an ideological idea par excellence. Let's repeat that last sentence again. I think that's the main thrust of the book. And if you can, you know, catapult it or capture it in one sentence. So the insistence on the fact that a certain cleft, a certain fissure, misrecognition characterizes the human condition as such by the thesis that the idea of a possible end of ideology is an, ideologi is an ideological idea par excellence. So there's no escape from ideology, according to Zizek here. Although Althusser has not written extensively about the ethical problems, it is clear that the whole of his work embodies a certain radical ethical attitude, which we might call the heroism of alienation or of subjective destitution although or rather precisely because Althusser refuses the very notion of alienation as ideological. The point is not just that we must unmask the structural mechanism which is producing the effect of subject as ideological misrecognition, but that we must at the same time fully acknowledge this misrecognition as unavoidable. That is, we must accept a certain delusion as a condition of our historical activity of assuming a role as agent of the historical process. In this perspective, the subject as such is constituted through a certain misrecognition, the process of ideological interpolation through which the subject, quote unquote, recognizes itself as the addressee in the calling up of the ideological cause implies necessarily a certain short circuit, an illusion of the type, quote, I was already there, end quote, which is, which as Michel Fou, who has given us the most elaborated version of the theory of interpolation, Interpolation means to be interpreted and in, interpreted. Um, so history interpret interpolates subjects. They are a uh, manifestation of this historical social process, essentially. So pointed out, it is not without its comical effects, this short circuit of no wonder you were interpolated as proletarian when you are when you are a proletarian. Here Pichot is supplementing Marxism with the Marx brothers, whose well-known joke goes, quote, you remind me of Emmanuel Ravelli, but I am Emmanuel Ravelli. Then no wonder you look like him. In contrast to this Althusserian ethics of alienation in the symbolic process without subject, we may denote that the ethics implied by Lacanian psychoanalysis as that of separation. The famous Lacanian motto, not to give away on, not to give way on one's desire, is aimed at the fact that we must not obliterate the distance separating the real from its symbolization. It is this surplus of the real over every symbolization that functions as the object cause of desire. So that which we cannot incorporate into our symbolic world, into our world as we experience it, is the object cause of desire, is that which uh, draws us ever more to invest ourselves in our desires, which are not the cause of our desire, but the uh, illusion of the cause of our desire. The uh, object cause of our desire is outside of our symbolic framework located in the real. To come to terms with this surplus, or more precisely left over, means to acknowledge a fundamental deadlock, antagonism, a kernel resisting symbolic integration, dissolution. The best way to locate such an ethical position is via its opposition to the traditional Marxist notion of social antagonism. The, tr the traditional notion applies two interconnected features. One, there exists a certain fundamental antagonism possessing an ontological priority to mediate all other antagonisms determining their place and their specific weight, class antagonism, economic exploitation. Two, historical development brings about, if not a necess necessity, at least an objective possibility of solving this fundamental antagonism and, in this way, mediating all other antagonisms. 
to recall the well-known Marxist formulation, the same logic which drove mankind into alienation and class division also creates the condition for its abolition. The wound schließt der Spier nur der sei schlug. The wound can be healed only by the spear which made it. As Wagner, uh, as Wagner, Marx's contemporary said through the mouth of Parsifal. It is upon the unity of these two features that the Marxist notion of, of the revolution, of the revolutionary situation is founded. A situation of metaphorical condensation in which it finally becomes clear to the everyday consciousness that it is not possible to solve any particular question without solving them all. That is, without solving the fundamental question which embodies the antagonistic character of the social totality. In a quote-unquote normal pre-revolutionary -re -pre state of things, everybody is fighting his own particular battles. Workers are striking for better wages, feminists are fighting for the rights of women, Democrats for political and social freedoms, ecologists against the exploitation of nature, participants in the peace movement against the danger of war, and so on. Marxists Marxists you are using all their skill and adroitness of argument to convince the participants in these particular struggles that the only real solution to their problem is to be found in the global revolution. As long as social relations are dominated by capital, there will always be sexism in relations between the sexes. There will always be the threat of global war. There will always be the danger that political and social freedoms will be suspended. Nature itself will always remain an object of ruthless exploitation. The global revolution will, will then abolish the basic social antagonism, enabling the formation of a transparent, rationally governed society. The basic feature of so-called post-Marxism is, of course, the break with this logic, which incidentally does not necessarily have a Marxist connotation. Almost any of the antagonisms which, in the light of Marxism, appears to be secondary, can take over this essential role of mediator for all others. We have, for example, feminist fundamentalism, no global liberation without the emancipation of women, without the abolition of sexism. Democratic fundamentalism, democracy as the fundamental value of Western civilization, all other struggles, economic, feminist, or minorities, and so on, are simply further applications of the basic democratic egalitarian principle. Ecological fundamentalism, ecological deadlock as the fundamental problem of mankind, and why not also psychoanalytic fundamentalism, as articulated in Marcuse, Eros and Civilization. The key to liberation lies in changing the repressive libidinal structure. Psychoanalytic essentialism is paradoxical insofar as it is precisely psychoanalysis, at least in its Lacanian reading, which presents the real break with essentialist logic. That is to say, Lacanian psychoanalysis go, goes a decisive step further than the usual post-Marxist anti-essentialism affirming the irredu irreducible plurality of particular struggles. In other words, demonstrating how their articulation into a series of equivalences depends always on the radical contingency of the social historical process. It enables us to grasp this plurality itself as a multitude of responses to the same impossible real kernel. Let us take the Freudian notion of the death drive. Of course, we have to abstract Freud's biologism, quote unquote death drive is not a biological fact, but a notion indicating that the human psychic apparatus is subordinated to a blind automatism of repetition beyond pleasure seeking, self-preservation, accordance between man and his milieu. Man is Hegel exit, an animal sick unto death, an animal extorted by an insatiable parasite, reason, logos, language. In this perspective, the death drive, this dimension of radical negativity, cannot be reduced to an expression of alienated social conditions. It defines la condition humaine as such. There is no solution, no escape from it. The thing to do is not to overcome or to abolish it, but to come to terms with it to learn to recognize it in its terrifying dimension, and then on the basis of this fundamental recognition to try to articulate modus vivendi within it. All quote unquote culture is in a way a reaction formation, an attempt to limit, canalize, or to cultivate this imbalance, this traumatic kernel, this radical antagonism through which man cuts his umbilical cord with nature, with animal homeostasis. 
It is not only that the aim is no longer to abolish this drive, uh, this drive antagonism, but the aspiration to abolish it is precisely the source of totalitarian temptation. The greatest mass murders in holocausts have always been perpetrated in the name of man as harmonious being, of a new man without antagonistic retention. We have the same logic with ecology. Man as such is, quote, the wound of nature. There is no return to the natural balance to accord with his milieu. The only thing man can do is accept fully this cleft, this fissure, this structural rooting out, and to try as far as possible to patch things up afterwards. All other solutions, the illusion of a possible return to nature, the idea of a total socialization of nature, are a direct path to totalitarianism. We have the same logic with feminism. There is no sexual relationship. That is, the relation between sexes is, by definition, impossible, antagonistic. There is no final solution. And the only basis for a somewhat bearable relationship between the sexes is an acknowledgement of this basic antagonism, this basic impossibility. We have the same logic with democracy. It is, to use the worn out phrase attributed to Churchill, the worst of all possible systems. The only problem is that there is no other which would be better. That is to say, democracy always entails the possibility of corruption, of the rule of dull medi mediocrity. The only problem is that every attempt to elude this inherent risk and restore quote unquote real democracy necessarily brings about its opposite. It ends in the abolition of democracy itself. Here it would be possible to defend a thesis that first post-Marxist was none other than Hegel himself. According to Hegel, the antagonism of civil society cannot be suppressed without a fall into totalitarian and totalitarian terrorism. Only afterwards can the state limit its disastrous effects. It is the merit of Ernest Laclau and Chantal Mouffe that they have in hegemony and socialist strategy developed a theory of the social field founded on such a notion of antagonism, on an acknowledgement of an original quote unquote trauma, an impossible kernel which resists symbolization, totalization, symbolic integration. Every attempt at symbolization, totalization comes afterwards. It is an attempt to suture an original cleft, an attempt which is in the last resort by definition doomed to failure. They emphasize that we must not be quote unquote radical in the sense of aiming at a radical solution. We always live in an in inner space and in borrowed time, every solution is provisional and temporary, a kind of postponing of a fundamental impossibility. Their term radical democracy is thus to be taken somehow paradoxically. It is precisely not radical in the sense of pure, true democracy. Its radical character implies, on the contrary, that we can save democracy only by taking into account its own radical impossibility. Here we can see how we have reached the opposite extreme of the traditional Marxist standpoint. In traditional Marxism, the global solution revolution is the condition of the effective solution of all particular problems. While here every provisional, temporarily successful solution of a particular problem entails an acknowledgement of the global radical deadlock, impossibility, the acknowledgement of a fundamental antagonism. My thesis, developed in Le Plus Sublime des Historiques, He Will Pass, is that the most consistent model of such an acknowledgement of antagonism is offered by Hegelian dialectics. Far from being a story of its progressive overcoming, dialectics is for Hegel a systematic notion of the failure of all such attempts. Quote unquote, absolute knowledge denotes a subjective position which finally accepts contradiction as an internal condition of every identity. In other words, Hegel Hegelian reconciliation is not a pan pan -log pan logicist sublation of all reality in the concept, but a final consent to the fact that the concept itself is quote unquote, not all, to use the Lacanian term. In this sense, we can repeat the thesis of Hegel as the first post-Marxist. He opened up the field of a certain fissure subsequently sutured by Marxism. Such an understanding of Hegel inevitably runs counter to the accepted notion of absolute knowledge as a monster of conceptual totality devouring every contingency. This commonplace of Hegel simply shoots too fast like the patrolling soldier of the well-known joke from Jarzleski's Poland immediately after the military coup. 
At that time, military patrols had the right to shoot without warning at people walking on the streets after curfew. 10 o'clock. One of the two soldiers on patrol sees somebody in a hurry at 10 minutes to 10 and shoots him immediately. When his colleague asks why he shot when it was only 10 to 10, he answers, I knew the fellow. He lived far from here and in any case would not be able to reach his home in 10 minutes. So to simplify matters, I shot him now. This is exactly how the critics of Hegel presumed panlogicism proceed. They condemn absolute knowledge before it is 10 o'clock without reaching, without reaching it. That is, they refute nothing with their criticism, but their own prejudice, prejudices, prejudices about it. Last uh, page here. To serve as an introduction to the, the aim of this book is threefold. To serve as an introduction to some of the fundamental concepts of Lacanian psychoanalysis against the distorted picture of Lacan as belonging to the field of post-structuralism. The book articulates his radical break with post-structuralism, again, the distorted picture of Lacan's obscurantism. It locates him in the lineage of rationalism. Lacanian theory is perhaps the most radical contemporary version of the Enlightenment. To accomplish a kind of return to Hegel, a, this is the second um, aim of the book, to accomplish a kind of return to Hegel, to reactualize Hegelian dialectics by giving it a new reading on the basis of Lacanian psychoanalysis. The current image of Hegel as an idealist monist is totally misleading. What we find in Hegel is the strongest affirmation yet of difference and contingency. Absolute knowledge itself is nothing but a name for the acknowledgement of a certain radical loss. To contribute to the theory of ideology via a new reading of some well-known classic, uh, classical motifs, commodity fetishism, fetishism, and so on, and of some crucial Lacanian concepts, which on a first approach have nothing to offer to the theory of ideology. The quote unquote quilting point, upholstery button, sublime object, surplus enjoyment, and so on. It is my belief that these three aims are deeply connected. The only way to save Hegel is through Lacan and this Lacanian reading of Hegel and the Hegelian heritage opens up a new approach to ideology, allowing us to grasp contemporary ideological phenomenon cynicism, totalitarianism, the fragile status of democracy without falling prey to a kind of postmodernist traps, such as the illusion that we live in a post-ideological condition. That is the end of the introduction.